We're here to talk today about Benjamin Franklin. Now we all know Benjamin Franklin is one of the founding fathers as a great scientist, inventor, diplomat, a man of many talents, many achievements. Today we're here to talk about him as an author, uh, and specifically uh, as the author of the, a project for moral perfection. Leon, can you tell us just what this project is? Well, this is a project which Franklin describes in his autobiography, and the, par the part uh, in which he's in his 79th year, he looks back upon the young Franklin, age 22, who conceives this bold and arduous project of attaining moral perfection. He wanted to live without faults. He wanted to conquer what natural inclination or custom or bad company might lead him uh, into uh, off the straight and narrow. Uh, and he discovered that it was a lot harder to do this than he thought. So he set about to do this rather methodically. He put together a list of 13 virtues, gave to each of these virtues a short little precept that would describe the full extent of what that virtue entailed. Uh, the virtues are temperance, silence, order, resolution, frugality, industry, sincerity, justice, moderation, cleanliness, tranquility, chastity, and humility. Um, and he uh, set about trying to acquire these habits, the habits of each of these virtues, in an orderly way. Uh, first trying to master the first and the second and so on. And uh, since there were 13 virtues, he could do uh, one week each on each of the virtues and have four courses of self-perfection in a year. And he continued this for many years until he got a little too busy and it was, became inconvenient. Um, but uh, as he reflects on this at the end of his life or toward the end of his life, he even though he doesn't obtain, attain the moral perfection, in fact, fails in many respects, he still credits this project with the happiness that he became a much happier and better human being than he would otherwise have been. And he recommends this project to his descendants that they should emulate him and reap the benefits. Amy, do you have anything to add to that? A couple of things. First of all, it's a project. The project, like all projects, a project is something you throw out in front of you. What's thrown out before him is a problem that he wants to overcome, the problem of his own moral turpitude or his waywardness. Secondly, and more importantly, I think this is a bold and arduous project. That has to be emphasized. To say it's arduous would suggest that it really is toilsome. Later on in the description, he uses the image of the garden and weeding. It's like weeding a garden which suggests that it's not something that is being done for its own sake, but it, it's done for something else. But even more interesting, it's bold. Why is it bold? It's bold. Uh, the very title, The Project for Moral Perfection, has a Christian resonance to it. And I suspect it is, he is identifying and clearly separating himself from the Christian tradition be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, Matthew. He is, has that in mind, but the assumption is utterly different. Human beings are not by nature sinful creatures or willfully evil creatures, but uh, human beings are just uh, are wayward because they have bad habits. Although, in a certain sense, for a Christian, this, pro this project might be a little bit easier because one would have the assistance of divine grace. Uh, one could uh, accomplish this through prayer. I mean, one reason this is so arduous is because it does rely entirely on Franklin's own efforts. Right. This is, this is a project of self-command um, by one's own self-exertions. Um, and the, this little uh, table for daily examination in which he gives himself bad black marks for when he, when, when he slips on each of the virtues, uh, um, he doesn't rely on anything beyond himself and his own self-criticism. He's going to develop and control himself. Okay. okay. And I like the point that you made, Diana, but 
he nowhere seems to think that divine grace is going to be of assistance to him. He does leave himself without certain resources that are available to those who believe in the Christian revelation. Yeah. Uh, but in, in another sense, uh, it's also easier for him because what he finds is not sin, but errata. Uh, and as a <laughs> printer himself, he knows that errata can be corrected. And so at one point, he, he doesn't keep track of the marks with pen and paper, but he actually switches to some sort of a tablet, which can be erased with a wet sponge. <laughs> so whenever he wants, he can just wipe away the memory of those, of those faults. Is there any significance to the fact that he's telling us this, not, not as a 22-year-old, not as a 40-year-old, but as a nearly 80-year-old, uh, reflecting back on his life? Your question invites uh, some thought about what Franklin is up to in telling us his yes. story altogether. Um, and although we don't, we can't go into it here. Uh, um, the entire autobiography leaves out all of the wonderful things that Franklin has done and for which he's famous. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we begin to think that maybe he's not just telling the story of his life as a record of his life as lived, but rather the presentation of his life uh, altered in such a way that it could become a model for. Uh, his descendants. It's addressed to dear son, um, and it's in a way, all of us are in some ways Franklin's children. Yes. He's also very mindful of the fact that his name, Franklin, in Middle English, Frank means free. Uh, he is playing with the name, and he would like all Americans to be free men, free Franklins. And these are the things that are necessary to make you free men, to have self-command. So he's talking about freedom from crushing poverty, freedom from the dominion of vice and debt, freedom from stultifying customs, freedom uh, from living at the behest of others, and freedom to go and to do and to think and to be whatever you want to be privately as well as public. Very interesting. Let me pick up on this a little bit and talk about the particular virtues that he chooses to emphasize. Are these virtues that are, are appropriate to uh, a particular way of life, the American way of life? Is there something American? about these virtues? Well, I mean, they do seem more commercial in character, the prominence that is given to frugality and industry, uh, so that it might point in that direction. I mean, Franklin is often associated with the, uh, with the bourgeois mm -hmm. virtues. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Those who disagree with Franklin and insult Franklin say, you know, he's the father of all the uh, uh, Kiwanians. Well, I don't think we should let the critics have the first word. I think we should <laughs> try to describe uh, and look at these virtues um, and, and see what you get from them. Yes. And I think uh, Amy's provided the, I think the, uh, the key idea on the virtues becoming a free, responsible individual who uh, can um, provide for himself, uh, can get along with other people, um, can contribute uh, both to his private and familial happiness as well as to the public good. Uh, he has, through temperance, he acquires that kind of coolness and clearness of mind that's required for um, doing just about anything you want to do um, in, in life. Uh, silence, as he says, enables him to learn from other people. Uh, and then order, anything that you want to do is certainly helped along uh, by, by a certain orderliness in your habits and in your ways of life. Mm -hmm. Resolution, resolve to do what you ought, and then you perform what you resolve. There are lots of people who have good intentions, but if they lack resolution, they can't do anything. And then you get into the, then you get into the virtues that have to do with wealth and industry. Frugality, so that you don't waste what you have, uh, and industry, so that um, you can provide for yourself, so that you can be responsible. And then sincerity and justice. If you've got the, if you if you've got sort of economic independence, you don't have to sort of look around enviously at what other people have. It's a lot easier to uh, have innocent thoughts and uh, speak accordingly. 
and in fact to do your duty by your neighbor and, and so on and the like. And then finally, um, I mean, I would emphasize also moderation, uh, avoid extremes, and very importantly, um, don't, uh, don't resent uh, those injuries done to you as much as you think they deserve to be resented. That's a guide against uh, wounded pride and anger, uh, the uh, presence of which destroys communal relations. This is um, an admirable, uh, responsible citizen who's not on the public dole, who gets along with other people, who's a good family man, a good provider, a good member of civic organizations, a good all around good citizen. And yeah, there might be some things missing, but if more people were like Franklin, the world would be a much better place. Yeah. I, I think especially today. In, if you take your bearings, especially where in Washington, if you take your bearings from Washington, uh, the, the moderation, as he understands it, avoid extremes, forbear resenting injuries as much as you think they deserve, and tranquility, uh, be not disturbed at trifles, uh, wouldn't that be useful for public life? Wouldn't it be useful? to have people who had so much self-command that they didn't, uh, that they were forbearing, that they were forgiving, that they were able to hold themselves in check. You know, a lot of what you're saying, I think most people would agree with in the abstract, but I wonder if they've thought about the degree to which other assumptions that come out of our popular culture and our way of life actually militate against Franklin-esque virtues. Can, can you think of any examples of that, of ways in which uh, things that seem in Franklin's text to be home truths are actually sort of counter-cultural in the contemporary environment? You're thinking That's about right. Venery? Well, <laughs> rarely. <laughs> but, but look, each, each yeah. one, the, the wonderful thing is the humor that is, well, I, goes yes. straight through this entire description. Now, why the well, humor, though, Amy? Because if, if, if he's presenting us in a straightforward way with a set of virtues that everyone ought to emulate, why does he do it in the way that he does? Why so tongue-in-cheek? Why so full of, of irony? Let, let me make a, a couple of very brief suggestions. Okay. One is, I think he really thinks that to be in command of yourself is perfectly compatible with accepting yourself. Secondly, I think uh, he thinks that um, what's in your interest could also be in the public interest. And third, I think that uh, what is good for you is also good for other people. And there is a sense in which, yes, these are virtues for everyone. He's offering himself as a model for emulation. But he also presents the ordering of the virtues as somehow attuned to his own soul and his own deficiencies and his own desires. So uh, he begins, as you say, with temperance. Uh, the reason for that is not that there's something in and of itself good about temperance, uh, but because a certain moral virtue actually leads to an intellectual virtue. It gives him a clear head. Right? Uh, he indicates then that uh, the reason he put silence next was because uh, he is interested not just in the acquisition of virtue, but he's interested in studies. Uh, he has his own studies that he wants to go forward with, and he realizes that he's getting into a bad habit of prattling on and joking and punning and engaging in this sort of frivolous conversation. And so it was particularly important for Franklin himself that that second virtue be silence. What we find out eventually, he doesn't acquire the virtue of silence. He acquires the virtue of uh, cheerful conversation. The virtues he acquires are actually an unstated list of virtues like tolerance or accommodation to others. So for instance, with order, he says, I, it proved very, very difficult for me to bring any order to my life. I'm not a very orderly person. But then he also makes the point the reason he could never stick to that order he had listed for the day was because other people have their own 
plans for the day and orders. And so he sometimes had to depart from his order in order to conduct his business with them in a way that was a, that, that accommodated them. So that, so, so that in fact, the, it, it seems to me there's a kind of, there's a second set of virtues here embedded in the first that really are a result of the failure of some at least in the, in the stated set of virtues. But don't forget the, he's reporting the youthful project that he has. And right. these are, these were the list of virtues that occurred to him to list at that time. But he's, he's being very playful as he's right. doing it. He's yeah. being, I, I would so, not say he's giving you a second list of virtues. There are hidden things that he's trying to say. He says quite explicitly in each of these explanatory self-injunctions that he gives or these little precepts, uh, it, you, sincerity, use, use no hurtful deceit. Which, which means, in other words, the virtue means use deceit well. Sometimes. Maybe as Franklin himself Sometimes. does, as yes. a diplomatist and as an author who yes. writes Don't under various yourself. masks and disguises. Exactly. And uh, actually, he says the, the virtue he has most difficulty with is order. Uh, that's the, the one that's most yeah. difficult for him. And then he lets himself off the hook. A speckled axe is best. So that, that's what I meant when I said he is self-accepting at the same time as he's trying to achieve a certain kind of self-command. And he says of himself that he, even though he never acquired all of these, he never, he never says that he acquired it or that anybody could ever be perfect, achieve moral perfection. But he was better for having tried. Yes, but, but but better why? Because he learned something about the needfulness of, for instance, with this last one about humility, imitate Jesus and Socrates. Uh, what he learned is you need to cultivate a reputation for that. Franklin, um, on the one hand, uh, in the autobiography, presents himself dissembling his superiority as a kind of everyman. You too can be a Franklin in Amy's uh, interesting sense of being a free man. Um, he's not trying to, to produce other people who literally are capable of living the kind of extraordinary life that he lived. Um, but the, the irony and some of these light touches, I think, uh, could be explained differently. Um, this is uh, not the ethic of the the beautiful fellow who makes virtue look simple, of, of sort of nobility, who levitates himself above the ground and is, is, makes a beautiful spectacle of himself. Nor is it um, uh, uh, easy, licentious self-indulgence of the hedonistic variety. And it's not priggish self-denial. Uh, what you've got is, uh, a kind of moral teaching that says the virtues are useful. Don't be too hard on yourself mm -hmm. if you don't reach perfection. And he gives you all kinds of clues about why even the maxims have exceptions or qualifications or things of that sort for the most part. So it's a kind of middling, um, not easy, by the way. I mean, let's 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 be clear. I mean, to have self-command, uh, being a human being, is not easy. Um, but uh, it's it is a kind of self-command that is compatible with self-satisfaction. Um, and with uh, the realization of your goals and having true self-esteem. It's not a matter of self-flagellation or self-denial. Um, so that uh, I think that explains in part the, the light touch here. That, um, you know, be serious about your character, but don't be too serious. And having a sense of humor about yourself is one of the ways of getting on in the world with other people, and it makes civil life possible. It enables you, in fact, to have your influence felt. It It'd also it enables you to separate yourself from yourself, to laugh even at yourself. Yeah, exactly. And he's doing that a lot of the time. He is dissembling. He is a great man. The, the American uh, model for the great man is the uncommon common man. You know, 
Abraham Lincoln, perhaps the greatest of all model Terry Truman in a way. And, and Franklin, it seems to me, is a kind of uh, early exponent of this view. And I think he's partly with that discussion of order trying to charm us. You know, he's like uh, the person who says, well, you really shouldn't drink, but, but I occasionally have a nip myself. And, uh, and, and it makes, it both affirms the precept but uh, affirms the falling away from time to time, mm -hmm. just as Leon says. Sure. Yeah. He, we wants talk to, he wants to charm us. He wants to draw us in yeah. the way stories often draw us in. But he also wants, finally, to enable us to see with him, yeah. to look at the world the way in which he's looking at the world, uh, which is not to take your bearings from the greatest excellence there is but to take your bearings from something that you can accomplish that you can do. You know, I wonder if this uh, quality we're talking about is, is, is American, is distinctively or at least uh, appears in the American soul in a fairly concentrated way. Is there a way that Franklin is kind of pointing towards the, the, the value of a sense of humor in a democratic commercial society? It's a necessary protection for the superior man. It's the mm -hmm. deference that he pays to the principle of equality. Yes, which, which yeah, is, is that, uh, well, I have foibles too, mm -hmm. uh, just like you. Uh, and and, uh, and, and this, this allows the, you know, the common person to sort of accept that, that, well, they may be great, but they're okay. They're one of, one of us. You know, it's a platitude today to talk about self-esteem. Everybody wants self-esteem. Our schools are promoting self-esteem. Yeah. Well, Franklin may be the originator of that platitude. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be able to accomplish something that makes you uh, feel that you are somebody. Yeah. But with this important difference, um, the feeling of self-esteem in the absence of that which should be estimable is hollow. And Franklin's not talking in the first instance about uh, self-esteem. He's talking in the first instance about self-command, which he can then esteem and be esteemed yeah, by good. others. Uh, you asked what kind of human being is produced here and whether there is a particular American type, and not just amongst our leaders. Diana mentioned that um, courage is missing from this list. Uh, that's quite striking. Uh, it suggests that these are the virtues of uh, American citizens in peacetime, let us say. Would you find fault with this, uh, this sort of picture of, um, of the good man and the good citizen for the United States of America? Something missing here? What I want to ask about is public spiritedness. Okay. Is there anything here that, I mean, we know Franklin himself is a man of very great public spirit. Uh, what in this list of virtues leads Americans to pull out of their narrow understanding of virtue as just something private and commercial? What leads them to engage in public spiritedness? I think it goes against our grain today to even think of making a list and uh, following it the way he does. But it seems to me to be the case that if your own house is in order, which is his first priority, then you are capable, if you're interested, in doing things for others. Uh, just humanly speaking, quite apart from Franklin, if you are so preoccupied, so weighed down by your own debts and your own vices and your own inclinations and desires, you never notice the other people that are around you. And yeah. Franklin gives you a very handy recipe for getting your house in order. But, but do we see that today? So for instance, with frugality, uh, the principle really is don't waste anything. But he says yes to spending, right? You're allowed to, to spend. He says that, you know, what we want to spend to do good to, to others and to ourselves. But don't we see today that people spend mostly just to do good for themselves? It is certainly true that Americans are notoriously materialistic. But it is also true that where the most philanthropic people 
in the world. Now, both of them seem to go hand in hand. Yeah, and, and philanthropy mm -hmm. is not possible without the wherewithal. Right. Um, okay. And uh, that's, uh, um, I mean, I think Amy's point uh, could be uh, embellished this way. Human beings are, in a way, naturally sociable. The question is, in what manner are you going to be sociable? Are you going to be sociable in a way in which you're looking upon other people as instruments of your own gain and advancement? Or are you going to be free from the kinds of necessities that make you think only in selfish terms so that you understand that it's in your own interest also to be uh, sociable, philanthropic, generous, benevolent? Uh, I think um, these are the virtues that are controlling the obstacles to being a free man in a free self-governing community. And once people go out there freed of those things that weigh them down, the other things will take care of themselves. I mean, you will engage with other people in mutual projects without simply thinking of yourself. And at the same time, you will also be self-fulfilled. It's a kind of remarkable but combination. Wouldn't you want Franklin as a neighbor if you have potholes in your street, Franklin is the sort of man who looks out on the world and says, what could I do? Well, there's a pothole. Let's fill it. That's a very useful neighbor to have. And the daily schedule that he makes for himself begins in the morning with the question, what good, good shall, shall I, do I do this day? day? And the evening question is, what good have I done this day? Uh, um, that's. Now, it looks hokey. None of us are going to make lists like that. But the spirit, the spirit is um, the world is there waiting for my effort. And uh, I can make the world a better place. Virtue is clearly not its own reward in Franklin's scheme. I mean, when you come to the end of our selection, he points to the felicity of his first 79 years as uh, as the justification for the project and and for the pursuit of virtue, so it's uh, and that's part of the appeal of, of you know self-interest rightly understood of that approach to virtue. But uh, there may be virtues like sacrifice, like cur extreme forms of courage. You know, the, the soldier that falls on the grenade to save his his buddies in the platoon. Uh, you simply can't be accounted for that way. Is anything lost by Franklin's way of tallying things up? I think yes and no. I mean, if we remember, he has two virtues for moderation. One is temperance, one is moderation. Mm -hmm. And that really is an, an accident. What he, I think, was most afraid of was fanaticism. Mm -hmm fanaticism of any form. And that might be a reason that courage is not included in this. We know from his life and from other things that he says in the autobiography uh, that he goes off to Philadelphia by himself at the age of 17 without basically anything and oh, makes yeah. a life for himself. That's an act of great courage. Not that's not even taking into account that he led a militia, that he organized militias, that he fought, and so on. So that he knows about that, but what he's worried about has to do with this kind of uh, extremism. And how do people get along together, just in ordinary life? There is something else I would say that is clearly missing here. Uh, and that is what most of us, uh, the bread and butter for most of us, there seems to be no longing in this man. Uh, I, I, I don't com completely agree. I mean, he does say what his desire is for, my desire being to gain knowledge at the same time that I improved in virtue. So virtue is instrumental, but he does seem to have this desire for knowledge. Maybe not even knowledge for its own sake. It was knowledge that, that was sort of useful. That also is going to be useful, That's yes. going to be useful knowledge uh, in a technological sense. Now, I would say you could, you could say that the picture of the human being that Franklin uh, presents as a kind of model 
we'll look to a young person today as flat-souled, a little too safe, a little too calculated, a little too rational, uh, no great passions, no great loves. There's nothing of the artistic uh, as well as the erotic uh, on the surface of this. And um, I think that's fair. I think, I think that criticism is somewhat fair. Uh, but um, the great geniuses of the arts will show up, mm -hmm. whether Franklin wants them to go that way or not. Um, and uh, the more important question is, for America as a self-governing country in which you want citizens who don't just um, uh, uh, enjoy the privileges of living here, but exercise some re responsibilities uh, in their schools, in their local associ civic associations, these are the people you want. Hawthorne and Melville will find a way to mm -hmm. uh, write what they have to write. A lot of other people who are being encouraged to uh, be writers would be better off uh, learning Franklin's virtues and going to the PTA. <laughs> the, the most serious objection to him, or the most famous objection to Franklin, was, I guess, uttered by D.H. Lawrence, who thought that uh, Franklin suppressed the dark, the darkness of his soul and the dark recesses of his soul, there, were n there was no access to it. It was flat and ugly and pale colored and so on. Mm -hmm. I think it's precisely because Franklin understands the dark recesses of the human soul that he takes the light touch that he does. Is, is the rarely used venery uh, meant to be uh, tongue-in-cheek, you think, that, well, that, that I, language. I think his tongue is very deeply in his cheek. <laughs> yes. And he says, rarely use it, yeah. but for so-and-so. Uh, it's, uh, he doesn't say don't. It's not, it's yeah. not a thou shalt not and thou shalt. It's it, it is used. Qualified. I mean, they're, they're the very grammatical construction suggests the logic of self-control that this is not something that you allow to use you, you use it. Right. So you are, you are in charge. Uh, yeah. That's because he knows from his own experience how reason can point you in two different directions. Yeah. Reason, it's very important to have reason in control, but reason can also be used as rationalization for your inclinations. And he, there are many, many anecdotes in the autobiography where he makes that perfectly clear to us. Are there any things that, that if Franklin were, um, uh, were to be able to come back and make some addenda, uh, not correct the errata, whatever, um, <laughs> that he or we should consider adding? I think um, Diana raised the question before. How do you promote public spiritedness? Is Franklin's list of self-command sufficient? Um, what about neighborliness or certain kinds of injunctions towards charity or compassion? Franklin might have in his own time suggested these things if he was not in the project of self-perfection, but was thinking about what civic virtues do we need explicitly. But I certainly think that um, beyond self-command and self-regard and, and self-respect, we do need we do need some of these other things, and they are, um, in some respects, in uh, rather short supply. A lot of people might wonder, because Franklin was the, the prototypical uh, white male, although hardly privileged in his time, that uh, the virtues he extols are peculiar to his, uh, his class, or particularly to his gender. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that, about whether these are uh, in any way gender-specific, male-specific? Well, I think they are not gender-specific. I think, in fact, these are the kinds of virtues that enable the what Henry James will later call the self-made girl to self-make herself. She is, in fact, employing many of the virtues that Franklin extols. She is a person who separates herself from her family, or one of the quintessential elements of the self-made girl is that 
She makes herself. She doesn't depend upon her parents. She has a certain kind of quiet. She's quick, handsome, and competent, sim simple, and self-possessed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's perfectly compatible with what Franklin is talking about. Would you perhaps say even that these are virtues that uh, may come more easily to women than to men? And that is, that what I'm thinking of is how you know, many writers of the 18th century talked about commerce as having a, a softening effect on morals and, uh, and because it facilitated uh, intercourse in the sense of, of uh, you know, de dealings between people in trade and, and, uh, and conversation and sociability. That uh, Getting back to courage one more time, the, these are not, none of these are what might be called manly virtues. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not to apply for a second that women don't exhibit courage and are not required to, but uh, martial virtues we tend to associate with men. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, none of these are martial or manly virtues. Um, any thoughts about that, about whether uh, uh, in some ways they're actually more feminine than masculine? Stretch it a little bit. Well, yeah, I guess in general I agree that they are gender neutral or kind of androgynous, but I think you could make an argument that in fact it cuts in a more feminine direction. So the, what he says about uh, moderation, uh, that seems, there he seems to be working against those who are in the grip of manly pride or manly honor and they take offense readily and they, they're, they're quick to anger. And so he really wants to get that under control in this, in this yeah. new order. Uh, moderation is a virtue which is maybe more associated with with women than with men and he gives a special pride of place to this virtue of moderation or even what he says about sincerity especially since he gives it this little twist and says that it's really about using deceit well uh, <laughs> there have been many political philosophers who argue that women in particular excel at that as, yes. as the weaker party yes. uh, they have yes. to resort to deceit or diplomacy or tactfulness yes. Uh, and so, yeah. Franklin, as a diplomatist himself, understands those those, those feminine wiles. And, and those things may even in, 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 in going on into the 19th century, past his lifetime, but this may be even more true that, that temperance, for example, is a, a, as a movement is associated right. with women. Right. Yeah, although presumably he would be opposed to that because there it becomes rather fanatical. Fanatic, fanatic, indeed. Exactly. So he's, uh, you know, the, 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 the temperance is not for its own sake and it doesn't mean abstinence. It, it means it, you don't, don't drink to elevation yes. and the reason is to keep a cool head so that you can carry forth your other projects. I wonder if he would have felt the same, same way about abolition, the abolition movement to abolish slavery, because that certainly was fanatical in some uh, Liam Lloyd Garrison, you know, he's the very picture of fanaticism. He, he, he has humility as a virtue, and Jesus comes in as a model along with Socrates of humility. I don't frankly understand no, in I what don't. sense uh, <laughs> that imitation uh, is, is intended and how the two of them are simultaneously and equally models, but never mind. Uh, but um, religion doesn't really enter in here. Reverence is not a virtue. Yeah. It's true that, that Franklin is trying to uh, shift away from fanatical religious teachings which divide people and uh, produce civil disorder and worse. Uh, on the other hand, um, he, has, he writes his own prayer to address powerful goodness. He has some kind of deistic view mm -hmm. here. Um, but uh, I'm wondering whether he hasn't left out something terribly important, both for private and public life. No, but, but and there the redefinition of chastity is very important. Uh, I mean, this is not a biblical understanding of chastity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not abstinence before marriage and fidelity within marriage. Uh, it's <laughs> you know, Less is more. engage in sexual activity <laughs> for health yes. uh, and or offspring. Uh, and he even suggests there may be certain times in which you could, you know, uh, be a bit of a philanderer so long as it didn't endanger anyone else's reputation uh, or, your, or your own reputation. 
Yeah. So he's he's playing pretty fast and loose with yeah. some yeah. of those traditional virtues and virtues that would have been very tied to, to, to women. Yeah, your comment um, leads me to, to wonder whether or not the success of Franklin's project, um, to the extent to which Americans have become Franklin's in this particular sense, very successful in our commercial republic, very self-reliant in many respects, whether that hasn't uh, undermined to some extent some of the moral teachings uh, which the country also needs uh, and the absence of which we now feel. In other words, uh, maybe the problem today is not religious fanaticism, but um, self-indulgence and uh, insufficient fear of heaven. We need a bit more of the Puritan residuum. I think one of the questions is about religion, about religion has to do with uh, the way in which he talks about moderation. Forbearance becomes very important. And uh, you could say, well, that's feminizing moderation, and that's instead of courage. But it certainly is compatible with a kind of religious uh, attitude. Secondly, um, if turn the you other cheek. Uh, turn the other cheek, okay? So there are things that are in this. The assumptions are radically different from the Christian assumptions. Men are, human beings are not sinners by nature. Um, but I don't think he would uh, suggest that hope or faith or charity are virtues that one ought not to cultivate. Fair enough. This uh, motif of, uh, of a chart detailing one's, uh, one's sins is, is a, becomes a, a, a sort of a staple in American literature. Interesting that Franklin continues to carry this with him. He says that he leaves off keeping the, the, the moral calorie right. count, but he, but he continues count. to carry yeah this, this little book around with him. But it seems to me there that the little book replaces the, the book of books, I mean, replaces that's very the, nice. the Bible. Uh, ah, that's very nice. I mean, also on the religious question, I would point to what he does with cleanliness. Uh, the, the argument is not that cleanliness is next to godliness or that there's some kind of purity of soul which is required. When he talks about cleanliness, it's entirely in terms of the body, and there's no hint at all that this cleanliness could have any kind of spiritual component or, or purity. Good. So I, I, I'm not so sure that he would include the theological virtues as, as virtues. That's very nice. Yeah. You think he would deny them? Um, well, I think he ignores them. <laughs> that he, he, he doesn't maybe would prefer he for doesn't them to ignore, go away. He doesn't ignore charity. Uh, he, he doesn't ignore good works. But in other words, this is a reconfiguration of religion to be cons to be just concerned with, you know, the good that you can do your your fellow man, yeah. and if a, if religion can contribute to that, then space can yeah, be made I, can I be made for right. it. But otherwise, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, and he talks about the great yeah. benefit of this is the constant felicity of his life yes. in this life. Right. In this life. This is a very this-worldly right. mm -hmm. right. center. And, and he would live his life over again. Yeah. Oh, yes, if given the chance. <laughs> they're <laughs> only erratas, and they're only five. Eternal like return of the same errors, is, is they okay would, with. You could rub them out like printer's yeah. errors. But, and hope, too. I guess you're absolutely right. It's not that he looks to something divine for hope. He looks to this world. Yeah. Do something. That's what's hopeful. That's what will give you hope. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to remind uh, viewers that uh, all of these uh, readings are available and further information and the videos of these conversations are available at the website www.whatsoproudlywehail.org.